Hey guys, it's Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher jumping on again for another edition of the EE Live Q&A, all designed to help you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry. Hey guys, welcome back. This is Canadian immigration lawyer, Mark Holthy, ex-immigration officer and former high school teacher, jumping on another edition of the EE Live Q&A to teach all of you how to avoid the disastrous situations that other people fall into when they're trying to file their own express entry application and are not watching these live videos. So this is actually 2.0 today because my Ecamm Live software was not cooperating with me and um, I, had, uh, have, I had to restart. So those of you who are jumping back on, thank you for your patience. I had to shut the previous one down. It's about quarter after 12 right now. This is our second version that we're starting. Those who are tuning in, please, please post in the comments where you're listening from because I absolutely love, love comments. And with that being said, I want to give a shout out to all of you who um, commented on my most recent YouTube um, video that I posted. And usually all of these EE Live Q&As are really form a lot of what is on the, um, the YouTube channel for the Canadian Immigration Institute. And many of you are probably watching it. But on Saturday, I posted a video entitled, What is Going On with Canadian Immigration? And I'm actually going to spin it out onto my Canadian Immigration podcast um, that's uh, hosted on iTunes as well. But I just wanted to say thank you so much. And, I, and now let's see if I can share my screen. Hooray! I can share my screen. That is awesome. Okay, so so what I so what I wanted to share here was this video right here called "What Is Going On with Canadian Immigration," and this video I recorded while I was down in Cottonwood Park. You guys are gonna have to check it out and uh, and watch it. It was um, uh, I just happened to be going for a walk down there. It was a little bit cooler. Pulled my toque off my head and just thought, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a little bit about immigration and why it's so crazy. And uh, there was, there's already been 1,200 uh, views that have watched it, and um, and I've had, uh, you know, I love the negatives. Oh, I love that thumbs down because it's definitely some consultant somewhere who's upset, and uh, I kick them out of the group, and so they always go on and give me a thumbs down. So awesome! But the 38 thumbs up, thank you so much, and check out all of these comments. So once I get down here. You know, so we've got 18 comments. And so those of you who are watching this as a recording, um, this EE Live Q&A, I love it when you comment. So please go down there and do that. And um, yeah. Now, I want to also address something for those of you who are watching this video for the first time. I am broadcasting from not where I am, of course, but where I would love to be. So a year ago, uh, my wife and I, um, we went with our kids uh, to the Hawaiian Islands. And so this beach on Kie, uh, this is where my kids were playing. And so if I move out of the way here, let you guys see. I'm going to slide right back here. Um, this is my kids were actually playing right in there in that water. And uh, there was someone fishing off of those rocks. And me as a fisherman, I can tell you, I absolutely love fishing. And I've never actually tried fishing off the shore in the ocean. So that's definitely going to be something that's coming up. All right. So I just thought I'd let you guys know if you have a beautiful location in your country that you want Mark to um, broadcast from, then send the photo to me, send a nice high res photo, or even just tell me the location and I can pull it up. So I just wanted to share that all with you fine folks. Okay. Now let's see where you're tuning in from. Ralph is laughing. He's hilarious. Yes. Max are so frustrating. Um, Patrick is Miami, Florida. Welcome, Patrick. Um, Sizzy says hello. Um, Prius from India. Let's see who else we have here. Marlon says hi. Harry says what's up. Uh, Marlon's from BC. So yeah, welcome to all of you guys that are tuning in here. Uh, today's actually going to be a great EE Live Q&A. Um, last week, I was a little bit late because I had another conflict and some other stuff going on. Um, but, uh, but I'm super, super excited to be back today. So here's how it works. So the first thing we do is I've got a few questions that were sent in by listeners in advance, and I'll go through those questions, um, for those who probably are watching on YouTube. And then as soon as we're through that, then we open up the gates 
and then you can post your comments um, and your questions that you want me to answer live. And I'll be honest, I don't know anybody that's crazy enough to do this like I'm doing live, answering your questions right on the spot about Express Entry. And um, you'll see when I create my when my website gets launched, one of my pet peeves is these nameless, faceless websites where you have no clue who's actually working with you. They've got lots of money sunk into fancy graphics, info, you know, info videos, all those kinds of things. Um, but you'll see from my my video, that, uh, sorry, from my website, the one thing that frustrates me most is these nameless and faceless um, presences. And you'll know right away that it's mine. <laughs> what I've been struggling with though is trying to figure out the kind of picture that I want on the front. And maybe the reality is maybe it should just be this because you guys, this is how you interact with me. And this is how my firm has been created in a virtual environment. So you guys get the benefit of not having to trudge down to uh, some lawyer's office or some consultant's office. We deal everything right here in this exact format. And for those of you who uh, who hire me to, to work with you and to collaborate together and putting your applications together, this is the same view. Now, we may not have uh, Kihei here behind me, um, but this is how we do it. We share screens and I love it, it's awesome. So with that video right here that I posted, go in and watch it because that gives you a little bit of an understanding of where immigration came from and why it is the way it is today and just some thoughts on why I set up my practice the way I did. So I encourage you to check that out. All right, so let's see who else has been tuning in here. So Noah is Haiti, very cool, living in the Dominican Republic, awesome. And uh, Chidima here is tuning in from Nigeria. Wow, that is so awesome. You guys that are tuning in when I know it's so late and the timing is just not great. For me, noon is how it works for me, but thank you so much for your, for your support. All right, um, <laughs> Harry, Harry Singh says, watched the YouTube video you recently uploaded and you got nervous when you thought background noise might be coyotes. That was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> it's a quite, it's a wilderness park. So when I'm down there, there's like no one else down there. And uh, so there was a period where I was recording and I heard some some noise behind me in the, in the, the trees. And uh, <laughs> yeah, you have to watch it. It was quite funny. It was quite funny. Yeah, I did think maybe it was coyotes. <laughs> Anyways, all right. So thanks for pointing that out, Harry. It's a little teaser. You guys need to go watch that video and uh, and you'll get to the, the, the funny part. All right. Um, okay, Asha K has already got some questions. So hold off on those ones. And so does Jaspreet hold off. And once we answer the questions relating to uh, the ones that were sent in, then we will dive into all of your live questions. Um, as we're going forward, I also want to point out here two things. One is this and the other is this. Actually, maybe this one's better. Yeah, I like that one better. I'm going to turn that one off. Oh, yeah, that's it. So if you have a question that you want to send for consideration in the next EE Live Q&A, send an email to info at holtylaw.com. Um, Marissa will... Uh, who's my intake specialist, Mercy is down in St. Kitts. Um, she will go through it and she pulls them together for me and then I can pull them up and I can go through, but you have to get it past Mauricia. And if you want your question to be considered, it needs to be something that's of a general nature that would benefit all the people that are actually tuning in and watching this. And so go ahead and please send an email to info at holtylaw.com. Make sure you put EE Live in the Q&A in the subject line that's this one right here, and that will tell Marissa that it's meant for the EE Live Q&A. And, a. and um, if you don't, then she will send you a request for an intake form um, to book a consultation, essentially. So that's how it works. All right, guys, so I'll just stick this one down here, info, and I'll put EE Live Q&A. Actually, let's flip them around. We'll do it like this for now. Good. Okay, we'll stick those right there so you've got them. All right, let's see. You've got a couple more people that have tuned in here before we jump. We've got, uh, okay, Sisse is Senegal. Awesome. And Rabi is from the UAE. Fantastic. We've got people all over the world, which is which is fantastic. Okay, let's, let's jump to the first question here. See if I can pull it up. I know I've got it here somewhere. Do, 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 do. There it is. Okay, so the first question that I'm going to answer, this one comes from, we'll scroll down a little bit here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. Um, hmm. Let's see. 
I'm just trying to find the right where I left off here. So we, I have a record of everything that people have sent, which is great. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Rabi says, hi, Mark. Thank you for your efforts. You are amazing. I would like to ask the following question. I worked as a school teacher for three years and teachers teach only nine months per year. Oh, this is a tough one. This is so tough. Teach only nine months per year in my school. So my three years of teaching experience with only nine working months per year is this, you know, will it be counted as three years of experience or less than three years? Okay. So one thing you have to appreciate is certain occupations like people who work on ships, mariners, those kinds of things. Sometimes they're six months on and six months off. Well, Immigration, understand IRCC is ruthless, cruel, and really doesn't care about you. They don't. And if they are pretending or seem like they do, it's a lie. They don't. So you have to prove to them why you have the work experience that you have. The rules are locked in and it's pretty simple. You need to show that you've had at least one year of continuous, continuous full-time or equivalent in part-time, in other words, two years of continuous work foreign work experience that's been paid in order to meet the minimum threshold. And if you do not have that, in the case of a teacher, it's always a little bit tricky, um, especially where teachers are only paid for the time that they're actually working. In Canada, teachers are on a yearly contract, generally speaking. And um, so even though they have the summers off, they're still paid and that's still considered to be full-time employment throughout. But if you're in a situation where you're teaching actually is only nine months and then you receive no compensation or anything for those breaks, there is a significant likelihood that that position, you will not be able to count those three months. So when I have clients in these situations, I always look for every way possible that I can to meet that first one year. And usually for people who are qualifying through Express Entry now that are ranking high enough, well, they're pretty young. They usually have excellent education, masters or more. And the three years of skilled work experience, well, the reality is to meet the minimum threshold for the federal skilled worker program. And let's just jump open this up really quickly and I will share my screen with you. Okay, there we go. And when I open up this link to the federal skilled worker program, it has its requirements. You'll see that there is actually a separate grid that you have to score 67 out of 100 points. So these selection factors, many people don't even know this is happening. But for most of my clients to meet these, they already have really high language. They, they have really good education already. And then it comes down to the work experience, maximum of 15 points. Well, with only one year, you're still getting nine. And for a lot of my clients, even with one year of experience, they're still able to meet the 67 point threshold um, with just one year of skilled work experience. And remember, the one year continuous full-time work experience is for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Once you have met that, you can see right here, same occupation in the last 10 years, paid one year continuous. So once you've got that, then you can pull work experience in blocks from other skilled work experience that's paid from other NOC codes in, in bits and pieces. But you need to meet the minimum entry criteria for the Federal Skilled Worker Program first. And you can only do that by doing this. So in, in the case of... Um, of um, of our friend here who sent the question in, um, it's gonna be really difficult unless you can find that one year. Once you've got the one year, you probably meet the Federal Skilled Worker Program eligibility. Then if you're only, if you, if you need to count those nine months at a time, you can do that and then bundle them together. Now I'm almost positive out there that someone has answered the questions in such a way that, and got reference letters in such a way that it gives the officer an impression that they are actually full-time employed for three years and have probably as a teacher got through. But what I know from a legal standpoint is that the officer has a tremendous amount of discretion and they can choose to accept the fact that yes, even though you're not working, you are a full teacher and you have been working full time for four years, but the officer could very easily say, nope, I'm only giving you credit for those nine months and you do not meet the minimum threshold. And uh, because you don't have that one year full time continuous work, then I'm not going to allow your application to go forward. So that's possible. So I can't really give you an answer as to how you can um, protect yourself from this. If you're in a situation where you're working and you have those three months off and they're not paid, then any occupation like that, you're just gonna have a hard time qualifying. And, um, and so 
uh, and, and understand immigration, express entry, they don't care about you. They do not care. They only will take the people who are easy, who can easily approve it, uh, prove their work history. And those that, that can't, well, that's your problem. It's like having educational, um, like going to a school that is burned down and all the records are, are gone. Or you've gone to a school and it's, no, it's closed. It's no longer in operation. Well, West doesn't care. If you can't get the credentials, you can't prove it, you're not coming to Canada. And immigration shows no mercy. If you can't get a reference letter, you have no way of proving that work experience, immigration doesn't care. They're not going to accept it. So they, at least they won't accept your verbal attestation. Yes, I promise. I actually worked. I did all of this. Here's my letter. I swear an affidavit. Not good enough. All right. So understand, cruel, heartless, don't care. Have I said that before? Yes, I think I have. <laughs> okay. Now we're continuing on. Next question on the list uh, that was sent in. Um, this one is from, let's see if I can find where we left off with here. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. So this one is Mady. And Mady says, Dear Mark, hope you're doing good. I'd ask a question for the next EE Live. While filling the PR application forms, I came to one concern regarding my spouse name. In my EE profile, I didn't pay attention to the explanation of how to fill in the name field. Hence, I put the spouse's name for my spouse. Um, let's see. Actually, I think I answered this one, didn't I? Yes, I'm answering one that I've already answered. And of course, Mauricio has already said that. You answered that on February the 11th. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay, moving on to the next question. Okay, this one's a little bit longer. I'll probably only answer one of these. Okay, hope you're having a fantastic day. My wife and I are in the process of uploading documents post-ITA. Congratulations, Sudanshu. That's awesome. We have done a lot of research while creating the documents, but just have two open-ended questions. I would really be grateful if you can shed some light on these so I can be reassured. Okay, so I'll answer the first question here. My wife is the primary applicant and I am the dependent spouse. I have work experience outside Canada for nine years. I have a good reference letter from my first stint of seven years. Do you think I should add my work experience in work or personal history? I've mentioned that I have work experience in India in my pre-ITA profile. Please advise how to proceed. Okay, so this is a classic example. Um, my friend, you should have purchased a subscription to my EE Live Q, my express entry do-it-yourself guide where it would have told you right away at the profile stage that you don't need to list your work history in the, uh, the section um, for an accompanying spouse if it's foreign work experience. Only Canadian counts. So obviously anything you put in there is going to result in the, the computer system because it's stupid, understand? If you put something in there, it then creates a portal. I shouldn't say it's stupid. It just doesn't have an ability to think outside the box that, oh, this is foreign work experience. This person is getting no points for it. It's serving no purpose. So I'm not going to ask them to provide a reference letter. They, it just does. So when you have a situation where you are an accompanying spouse and you've indicated here that your spouse is your primary applicant, you do have the ability to remove that and explain it. In my profile, I put my work history. I now realize I don't need any of that. Everything is in my personal history and you can do that. But understand any changes that you make to your profile, they then will be looked at carefully by the officer. And whatever you do, any, any change you do, I would make sure that you explain it in a letter of explanation. And for so many months, well, really for years, I used to give immigration the benefit of the doubt. I used to say, well, an officer is reasonable. You know, they will, they will, you know, they'll under, they'll get it. Like they'll understand why I'm making the change. I don't need to explain everything. Well, that's until I've watched the train wreck that has been happening lately. And I shouldn't say lately, really over the last year or so, where we've got so many candidates that want to come Immigration just doesn't care. They'll routinely just return um, applications without thinking twice, knowing very well that this person they're returning the application may never get drawn again. And that really, really upsets me. I think it's cruel and heartless, but that's what you guys are facing. So those who have an ITA, you better understand that it is precious. And any changes you make, this is not some simple thing because you miss something you, you, you go past um, you know, a question and answer it improperly, which causes an officer to, to anticipate or interpret something in a different way than you intended. Well, you can get your application at best returned, at worst refused um, for, for being ineligible. So yes, you can make those changes, um, 
but you better make sure you very, very carefully outline how they're not going to impact your minimum entry criteria or the round of invitation level, your comprehensive ranking system score, such that it would drop below the level where the invitation to apply uh, uh, was granted to you. So I'll just share one other thing here for those of you who are looking at making changes. So there's a site called A11.2, um, and this site is really where an officer will assess an application to make sure that it's complete for the purposes of the, the process. But it also deals with changes that occur from what's put into a profile to ultimately what is submitted in the EAPR. And this talks about certain things that, you know, changes in circumstances that are now declared in the EAPR. And potentially that could result in what you're talking about. There's requirements to maintain the minimum entry criteria. There's um, requirements to maintain the CRS score. You can see there are uh, candidates and how they're impacted with provincial nominees. And there's even, remember, an exemption if you have a birthday. So your birthday is locked in at the date you get your ITA, but nothing else is. And then the whole how they treat misrepresentation, um, change in family composition, settlement funds. So you can see this is really this is the really deep, deep dive, this section here. So just to conclude my last, you know, that last discussion that I was having here um, with um, Sudanshu, you need to be careful. And before I'd say, no, we're, no worries, don't worry about it. But I've just seen so many heartbreaking things lately that I just, it just, I just don't get it sometimes. I understand efficiency and I've ranted a little bit in my video, a little bit, the one that I told you to go back and watch on the YouTube channel. But, um, but ultimately it's understand guys, this is not an, a simple process. It's not an easy process. And those, of, those who think it is, um, usually are the ones that are sadly, sadly disappointed. Okay. All right. Now I don't mean to fear monger, but that's a reality. Okay. This, this question is from Ruth and Ruth's question is this first and foremost, I'm so thankful that I found an immigration lawyer that is so kind, very accommodating and never ending patience to all his listeners and clients. I will not be taking more time. I know you're very busy. Okay, I have a few questions that I know in my heart you alone can answer my questions. Okay, Ruth, you're going a little bit over the top there. That's a little bit too much. There's lots of people, there's excellent immigration lawyers across the country that can probably answer your questions. But none of them are as crazy as I am to just get on a video and give it all away for free. So, uh, but hey, that's how I'm wired. Okay, currently I am answering my application for permanent residence in Canada regarding my parents' information. The last time we saw our father, as far as I remember, um, uh, she says she was only seven years old and now she's 40. However, until now, we haven't seen our father, even his family, relatives, and friends. We don't know where he is and what is going on with my father. And the only rumor I heard from my father's side is that he's already dead. My question is, what am I going to write, deceased or what? Really confused, because if I write deceased, date of death, where I do not know if he is already dead or not, no one knows where he go and uh, knows where you go. That's right. Okay, so it's pretty simple. Anytime you have, once again, it's not simple, it's complicated, but here's how you do it. Um, when you're answering the question, if you don't know whether he's alive or dead, um, then just choose. You know, if, you, if, he's, if, if you're not sure that he's, uh, that he's dead, then I probably wouldn't put that he's dead unless you have confirmation of that. But um, in terms of where he lives and his birth date, do the best you can. You have to fill something in, otherwise the form won't, it won't close. Like you can't advance to the next screen. You can't get that nice little green check mark. And so you have to make sure that when you're doing this, whatever information you put in, you put in some dummy placeholder information, then in your letter of explanation, you very clearly and de in detail explain why you answered the question the way you did and explain the fact just like you've explained to all of us here on the video that you don't know what happened to him. You haven't had any contact with him. And since you were seven years old, you, you don't know if he's alive or dead, but in order to get your EAPR screen to advance to the next section, you answered your question this way, but understand you don't know. And that's just a guess. Okay. That's how you do it. All right. So now I'll move on to the next person. And for those who have posted, um, I want you to understand that, um, yeah, I'm, I, I only will answer one question, but if you guys, anyone who has questions that are very specific and unique to you, 
then in those circumstances, a, a, a consultation is the best way to do it. And in 25 minutes, usually we can answer, excuse me, pretty much everything that, that you need answered. Okay, so you can always do that. And uh, for those of you um, who are wondering, well, Mark, how do we do this? I'll share my screen again. All you have to do is go to this landing page, which very soon will be a real page. And you just have to go here to wholefoodlaw.com and just fill in the consultation form. There's information here on the right. It's $200 for 25 minute consult. And then it's just, whew, it goes fast. We get you in quick, answer the questions and then provide whatever additional help or support that you might need. All right. And those of you who are tuning in, I guess if I have had a consultation with you, go ahead and post on there and tell people whether it was a waste of your money or not. Because the last thing in the world I want is to be up here telling everybody, oh, these consults are so good when people feel like they're a complete waste of time and their money. So there you go. All right. Now let's jump back. And I think I think I've, maybe I didn't even share the screen. I think I did. So Holthy Law right here is where you go. Uh, dot com and then fill up this cons the schedule a consult and then on the right here is information just on how much it costs okay all right simple can't make it any easier than that and I even have a payment portal up here in in the right here anyways okay so going forward let's jump back and let's see we I think I might have one last question um, okay so this one is also from Mady and Mady says again me I'm also a repeat, a repeat client yes Mady you are I am about to push the famous button for application submission and guess what? Question mark. So this is sent to me February the 17th. So this is yesterday. <laughs> okay. All right, matey. My, my one answer is if you're freaking out, then why would you not just book a consult and let's take a look at it? But anyways, again, me, I'm also a repeat client. I'm about to push the famous button for application submission and guess what? Very stressed, even if I am pretty sure that I prepared things very well, of course. And guys, that is the exact reason that people hire me to, to work with them is because I provide that peace of mind because two people, two heads are better than one. And that's the service that I offer to my clients um, when they retain me. It's a collaborative process and we go through everything together and submit it together. All right, my question will be regarding the travel history part. Okay, and this is actually, this is the focus question of the EE Live Q&A today, travel history. So it is a bit confusing to me as they are, and I guess I could also look, it's about 2730. So if I make a note of that, 27, 2730, that's when I answered the feature question. All right, so I'm about to push the famous button, all right? And um, it says, okay, I'm a bit confused. They are also asking for the travels done by my family members. Shall I disclose every travel done by, my, by all my family, brother, sister, parents, and in-laws during the last 10 years? And what if the travel is not displayed in the passport pages in case it has been renewed recently? Take care and thank you. Okay, so Mady, the only travel history you have to provide is you, your spouse, and at times um, any children over the age of 18. So dependent children. That's the extent of it. You don't need to provide travel history within the express entry program um, uh, process for uh, brothers, sisters, parents, you don't need to do that. So you don't need to worry about it. Okay. That was pretty simple. Um, you just need to deal with your own. Now I'm going to jump in and I want to, um, I want to talk a little bit more right now about filling out that travel history because it can be a real pain. And when you're going through the travel history, um, one of the challenges that we see, and just while I'm talking here, I'm going to multitask here and see if I can do kill a couple birds with one stone here. But when you're doing the travel history, and I'm gonna log into my actual course here, um, the one thing that you'll notice right away is that um, it asks you, let me see if I can pull it up. I'm gonna pull it up on my computer. I'm actually gonna share my screen with you guys now. Okay, so here's my do-it-yourself guide. And this is, this is the view that it looks like when you have an individual, I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger here so everybody can see nice and big. There. So um, whenever you're logging in, this is what you see and you can resume your course. Here's all the categories. So I'm going to jump to the EAPR forms and in particular, I'm going to go down to the principal applicant and the work history, the personal history. So I'm going to click on this video and each video relates specifically to every section. So then I'm going to go through here and I'm just going to show you. Let's see if we can find Tell us about each, whatever it may be. So for any time, 
we'll put here. But you, see, this is. And you can see, you, guys, I want you to see something. I have to gray out this stuff. I have to. You have no idea how long it takes. I'm sure there's probably a better way of doing it. But my clients give me authorization to go in and then update information. Um, uh, and I should say use their, their, their EAPR portal to create these videos. And in order to maintain confidentiality, I have to gray out all of their names. <laughs> and so it is not just me going on and just talking, but I go frame by frame to make sure that uh, confidential information is blocked out. Okay, so back to this. I'm gonna, let's see if I can, I'm not even sure if I can blow it up really big. Well, I can a little bit. Let's see, yeah. Okay, so this here is, is what the clients see. And I wanna show you what it says. So this is exactly what the travel history says. It says, provide details of any trips you have taken outside your country of origin or of residence in the last 10 years or since your 18th birthday, if this was less than 10 years ago. So include trips, tours, and business training, okay? And so you can see here um, that what it indicates, you're supposed to provide from and to, so the month and actual day, and sometimes that causes problems for people. And then the country visited, city, town, and the purpose of travel. So what do you do? Well, here's how I deal with this issue. When I'm going through this process and I am trying to help a client to fill up the travel history, a couple things. I never ever put travel history that overlaps with what you've put in your address history. So if you're living in one country and, um, and then, but it's not your country of, of citizenship, in other words, your, your, your origin, then I don't put that in the travel history. And you can see here, it says any trips you've taken outside your country of origin or of residence. So if you're currently residing there, you're not going to put that in here. So you'll never have a period where your travel history and your address history are overlapping. And think of it this way, immigration, Canadian immigration authorities, immigration, refugees, and citizenship, Canada, those officers want to be able to see exactly where you've been every single day for the past 10 years. So if you have listed an area as your address and you haven't traveled anywhere, then they're gonna presume that you're there. If you've gone and left that place where your address is and visited somewhere else, then I put that as travel history. And here's a little tip. Now, whether or not it's correct or whether or not an immigration officer would advise you differently, even if you go back to your country of origin for a visit, I put, and it's only for a couple of weeks, I include that as a, as, a, as a travel. So if you're currently residing in the US and you go back to India to visit your family for a week or two, I put that in as a travel history because then that shows the officer where you've actually been, all right? And then the anchor is the US if that's where you're living and that's in your address history, all right? So that's how I do it. Now, the next question that was asked and I think I can now close this out. Let's see if I can shrink this back down. Good. And I'll go back here. The next part of that question was, what if my passport pages don't match up with it? Well, um, I, I would also go back into my course here. Let's see if I can go back into my course. I'm going to blow it up. Actually, let's see if I can do this. I want to, this actually gives you guys a really good look as to, as to what this, you know, how this whole course is structured. So I'm going to go back into um, categories and then I'm going to go down to uploading your documents. And lesson 40 is one that I'm more proud of than any. But let's see if we can just see. I'm the thing sure that we're doing if I did this, to the bottom works. It creates encourage So I talk It'll about that. Easy. Talk about all it's that a little bit stuff. of age. I'm trying to find the place. Okay, here. Okay, so here. I'm going to pause this right here. Okay, so, and then uh, let's see if I can enlarge this. Okay, there you can see. Okay, so you will see if you go in here and you scroll, we have to, I can't really scroll, but if you follow my mouse all the way down, you'll see passports, travel documents, multiple. Okay, if you click on that question mark right beside it, it will say to you that you only need to provide your current document, your current do travel document, your passport, and any stamps or marking marked pages. It does not tell you to provide passports for every, um, you know, all of your previous passports that are all expired. It doesn't say that. All it says is your 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 valid travel document and your and I'm paraphrasing here because I can't open this up. 
and I'd have to actually go into a live client uh, view, which I also can't do on a, a video like this. But the whole object here is is to understand that when it comes to passport, uh, your passports, you don't have to provide all of your old passports um, that have all the stamps for your travel over the past 10 years. You don't have to do that. And there's a reason for that. The reason is because individuals who, um, who are going through that process and actually are, um, uh, are, are completing their travel history, um, probably, how, how long ago was it have been? Maybe it's been three years now. But the immigration used to require you to provide police certificates for every country that you have had been in um, cumulatively for six months over the past 10 years. Well, not in a row, but actually every little two week period, if you added all of those up and it amounted to six months, they'd make you provide a police certificate. They've changed that now. But then one of the ways they would trick people is they'd ask their passports and if they found visa stamps in their passport that suggested they had been in a country more than six months, then they would return applications and refuse them for not providing police certificates. But that whole world has changed. It doesn't exist anymore. So anyone that's trying to say you need to provide all your old passports, well understand they're a lightweight who doesn't understand, who are dealing only with their own personal practice and, um, and they've learned off of the backs of their clients by making wrong mistakes and destroying people's lives and they don't actually know the law or why things are being requested. And so there you go. All right. Once again, time is soaring by lightning fast. I need to get to some questions. So um, I'm, I've, I just realized that I had bumped up one of my reviews to one o'clock. So I am so sorry. Um, but at, fire your questions away and I'm going to try to whip through as many as I possibly can in the next 10 minutes. You guys have been so patient waiting. I think I'm probably, once I'm done this, um, I think I may go on and do another live one right away. If you have a question that you did not get answered that relates to Express Entry today, please, please just send me an email, okay? Send me an email and don't forget to put EE Live Q&A in the subject line. So you're going to send it to info at Holty Law and let, and, and let Maricia know that that question is to be um, responded in the next EE Live Q&A and I'll make sure that it's answered 100%. But let's see what we can do here. Okay, so going through, uh, let's start. Uh, we'll start here with, um, okay, we'll start here with, uh, do, 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 do. okay, I'll say that. I'm 32 years old, a registered nurse from Jordan. What is my chance to immigrate? Okay, question I can't answer. That, my friend, you would need to book a paid consultation because that relates specifically to you and is of not uh, beneficial generally to everybody that's listening. So I'll say that. I encourage you to book a paid consult and we can go through all of your possibilities, okay? Because it's impossible to know that without going through it in detail. You know, IELTS scores, a whole bunch of other things that are critical. Okay, Furkan says, what about recent Alberta Express Entry is I've heard that it has less requirements. There isn't less requirements. The reality is that Alberta is looking for a particular occupation. If your occupation fits that bill, then you could very well get a notification of interest. They're not as concerned about comprehensive ranking system scores. What they're concerned about is, the, um, is whether or not you have work experience in the area that they are looking for uh, in terms of filling shortages in the province. Okay. Um, okay. Jaspreet says, I got rejected for a visitor visa. Will this affect all my immigration application? No, it doesn't, but you better disclose it. Disclose that it was refused. Don't ever, ever hide it. If, ever, if there's ever a consultant um, that ever advises you to not disclose a prior refusal, fire them immediately, get your money back because a prior refusal does not negatively impact on your express entry um, if it's just a mere visa refusal. It's different if there's misrepresentation or you have other bars, you've been deported from Canada or had a, a refugee claim filed that's resulted in you having to obtain an ARC, an authorization to return to Canada. But um, yeah, anyone who says that, fire them immediately. Um, but you can be found uh, barred for five years from Canada for misrepresentation if you don't disclose it. And that includes any other country too. Okay. Uh, Jasdeep says, Hey Mark, you might remember, hopefully my AOR is December 27th medical passed on January the 16th biometrics completed. Okay. I received, um, requ RP RF request. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Sometimes they, um, you know, they'll, they'll request that sooner. Now, obviously Jasdeep, you're, you know, that's pretty fast to have an AOR December and, 
you know, uh, and and you're already getting the uh, RPRF, the request for um, the uh, permanent resident fund, essentially, that, um, that sort of the request for the permanent resident fee, that request is usually doesn't happen that fast. So that's a positive note. Okay, um, Jaspreet has asked the question. Um, uh, okay, is this possible? We log in file for PNP PR from India, then visit Canada on tourist visa. Then we hire a lawyer there and try to get our PR filed in Canada. Jaspreet, you, you have to show that you actually are legitimately in Canada for the right, pers for the right purposes. Um, you can be a visitor in Canada and have a permanent resident application in the queue. It's possible, it is, but you need to make sure that you actually are eligible and qualify. Um, PNPs, um, yes, they will also potentially extend notifications of interest and uh, allow you to apply. But at the end of the day, the most important thing to realize is that it's sketchy and it is not difficult. Uh, sorry, it's sketchy and it is really difficult um, to, to really make any forward progress when you're in Canada just as a visitor. Now, maybe coming as a visitor can help you to find a job and get a job offer. That's true. You're going to have a better chance of getting a job offer than if you're just applying online through the job bank from a country outside of Canada. Um, so that's one of the advantages. But yeah, it's not a simple matter of just hiring a lawyer and they're magically going to make things happen for you. Whether you're in Canada or outside Canada, your comprehensive ranking system scores the same. Um, you know, there, there's no difference. If you're in Canada as a visitor without any other study or work experience, it's not giving you any further advantage. Okay. All right. Bernard says, hey, Mark, do they request the original hard copy docs that were uploaded at a port of entry? And what about proof of funds at date of port of entry? No, they don't ask for any hard copies of anything. At the port of entry, you're going to bring, yes, you will, in that sense, proof of funds, you know, uh, what you submitted to the officers in the application. Or what I usually do is an updated bank statement that just shows that the funds are currently in the account. That's what I'll bring. But probably 5% of the officers ever actually ask for proof to see that you have the settlement funds. But always have it. No problem, Jasbreet. Um, okay, uh, CC says, can you travel to and from Met Canada uh, while an express entry PNP application is in process or my application be considered abandoned if I applied from within Canada? No, not at all. You can travel back and forth, whatever you wanna do, that's not an issue. You just have to make sure that the underlying things that you've put in your application are continuing to be accurate. Okay. Um, Gurjeet says, do the CRS score matter in Francophone and PNPs? Um, the provincial nominee programs that are associated with Express Entry will all give you 600 points. So from that standpoint, they, they give you enough points to guarantee that you're going to get an invitation to apply, whether it's Francophone, no matter what it is. So uh, in terms of the CRS score, yeah, it still matters. You have to have a profile. But once you get that nomination, you're getting 600 extra points, which with the rounds of invitations hovering around 472 and higher, um, yeah, it just, uh, it, that's really how the interplay works between PNPs and the, um, uh, the CRS score. Okay, uh, you're very welcome, Jasper. He says, thanks so much. Yusuf says, hi, Mark. I'm waiting to receive my PR card, how to track it. Yusuf, you got to call the call center. Um, it's the only way to do it. Uh, and here's what happens. I don't know if you have a, Yusuf, I don't know if you have a, um, if you used a representative or what happened, but usually what I see is if you're maybe a dependent, a company spouse, often, often when you land and you give your updated address to the officer, they don't update the dependent addresses. And so sometimes the dependent PR cards will go to whatever the address was when you filed your application or you know if there's another representative in Canada or another location in Canada they will send it there so that's often where the confusion is and it is a royal pain it's really difficult okay looks like I got through all of the questions which I'm actually really surprised so this is the end of the EE live Q&A today um, stay tuned as we go forward with uh, releasing the Holthy Law website which I'm really excited about and as I start to add new people to the firm, um, the more people that I add to help work through all of the logistics means the more time I'm going to have to do these videos. So check out the Canadian Immigration Podcast as well. I've got three new episodes I'm going to be releasing right away here. Um, one of them is uh, related specifically to appeals when you have an application that's refused. Um, and I have a whole series on immigration hearings and appeals. Uh, that I'm doing with my good friend Reka McNutt in Calgary. And I'm also going to be releasing another um, 
episode with another great lawyer, Will Tao, all on international students and the horrible things that are happening to them these days. So uh, yeah, you have to check that out and check out the most recently issued one if you are a recently landed permanent resident in Canada because it's with Windmill Micro Lending, which are a wonderful organization that give little micro loans to individuals to help them pay for their, the costs of applying to get their credentials um, registered with the various associations. And so there's a lot of really, really cool things that Windmill does. And I was super happy to have them join me to talk about some of the services they offer. So go check that out. CanadianImmigrationPodcast.com. You can find it on iTunes. All right. This is the end of it. Thank you so much, guys, for all the support as always. This is Mark Holfe, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher, signing off, wishing you all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry. <laughs>